So what is today's topic? Well, we're talking about social media and we're asking who, if anyone, should regulate it? Who should regulate it? Who should we trust to help keep us safe online, right? Do we need more oversight? Or perhaps we need fewer rules and regulations. Hopefully in the next 45 minutes, we'll be hearing a lot more from uh, my two guests and their different perspectives. And of course, we always want to hear from you. I'm so thrilled to see so many of you who are tuning in. It's great. Tweet us and I will get to as many of your tweets in the show as I can. So without any further ado, it's time to introduce my guest. I've got Raghav Mendiratar, a technology and human rights lawyer with deep knowledge and insight into the laws that govern it across the United States, United Kingdom and India. What a wealth of knowledge. And we've got Matthew Boutard, someone I've spoken to before and I'm delighted is here with us again. He's an expert in fighting online hate and is the founder of Bodyguard, an AI content moderation tool. Very welcome to both of you. Now, it's time to, to, to begin, okay? So let's set the scene of where things are at the moment. Billions of people around the world obviously use social media. It's how I'm connecting to all of you right now. And I, I understand the value of it, but we've seen social medias play large parts uh, important roles in change making, but they've also given rise to online hate and cyberbullying. And research suggests that social media, well, it might be linked to heightened mental health issues, things like depression, anxiety, and that is more acute in young people than ever before. So, my first question to both of you in the real world, we have teachers, parents, we've got doctors, police officers, lawmakers, so, so many different people that we entrust to keep us safe. But nothing like that really exists online. So, Rogov, if I might come to you first, how should we make our social media spaces safe or safer? Who, if anyone, should we regulate? I'll give you a minute or two to set out your perspective. Thanks, Nelufar, and it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be chatting with both you and Matthew. Let me set the context a little bit. So we're living in a very interesting time. We're living in a time where free speech has truly been democratized. I no longer need to be on great terms with the publisher um, of a magazine or the owner of a printing press um, or the controller of a town square to decide what and when I can talk. Um, but at the same time, there is no denying that a handful of tech companies today have a disproportionate amount of power over free speech online. 43% um, of all of the world's internet traffic flows through six tech giants and their subsidiaries. And I can imagine that everybody here can imagine what those are. So that's Google, which includes YouTube, that's Netflix, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon. Now, this makes these platforms the de facto gatekeepers of global information streams, where if YouTube decides to de-platform me, I no longer have the reach of putting out a video and reaching and having that video reach millions and millions of people at the click of a button, right? So this is the power that tech companies have and the disproportionate power, and this is unelected power. On the other hand, you have countries and governments around the world that are requiring, that are, in, that are exerting pressure on these tech companies and that are requiring these tech companies to take down more and more content, often at a very, very fast pace. So I'm currently talking to you from Copenhagen and in my neighborhood, Germany passed the Nets PG in 2017 and 2018 that required tech companies to take down content within 24 hours. A similar legislation was passed in France and similar legislation have been passed in countries like India, Pakistan, and shortly in the United Kingdom. Now, while these legislations are well-intentioned, um, they lead to platforms adopting a better safe than sorry approach. And what I mean by that is platforms will take down as much content as possible because they don't want to be on the wrong side of governments because if they are on the wrong side of governments and if they don't take down some content, 
they're risking themselves and opening themselves up to very, very large fines. So we're living at a very interesting time. And, you know, um, this is the context that we're in. Um, the answer to who should regulate social media, if at mm. all there should be regulation, if mm. it should be a balance of self-regulation and co-regulation. But an equally important question is, what should be regulated on social media? I'll leave it here for now, but I'm looking forward to digging uh, deeper into these issues later. Jargav Mandirathar, thank you so much. Well set out. Matthew, I want to come to you next. What is your perspective on this? How and who should be regulating us online? It's good to be with you again, Nilufa. And, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I think it was really good context um, uh, set up. What, what I want to add to the context is that um, we should not forget that social media has had a clear and positive impact on our lives. Uh, it is a part of uh, the world today, and it has you know, helped us connect with millions of people around the world, build communities, develop businesses. Um, so uh, we should not like, forget about that when we look at regulations. Uh, we don't want to go backwards. Um, so to answer the question about um, how we regulate, um, in my opinion, it's about creating the same environment. What I mean by that is our, our online life is as important than our all life offline presence. Uh, you know, at times, uh, who we are online is, is actually more important than who we are offline. Uh, to put it very simply, uh, in a legal perspective, you know, the internet is just a, an extension of our lives. So it's not another country, it's not another state, and it should be treated as closely as possible to the offline world. Uh, so that's my view on, on regulations. Uh, you know, laws uh, have been far discussed, written for decades, for centuries. You know, the amendments were there a lot, lot, long time ago. Uh, we've been having, you know, police officers for a long time, uh, and parents and teachers were there from the very beginning. Um, so the point is, we should have the exact same systems in place to regulate social media uh, and to regulate the internet. You know, we, we need policemen, policewomen on the internet. We need parents and teachers to educate us about what's out there. Uh, teachers need help, a lot of help to better understand what's going on. And parents should be doing more. Um, moving on to who should be doing that. Uh, it's interesting because I, I don't really believe in like um, self-regulation or co-regulation. Uh, I don't trust any of the big tech. To, to do that, you know, I've spent uh, seven years at Google and I know them very well. I, I don't think they would do anything um, to, you know, stop the businesses from, you know, moving forward. And a lot of that is due to the business models. So it's all about the external bodies, uh, governments, law enforcement agencies, uh, and uh, clearly, you know, France, India, the UK with the Earning Safety Bill, and Australia very recently. They made good progress, and uh, we should keep on going to that direction. Okay. Thank you so much, Matthew Boutard. I'm, I'm beginning to see little differences in the perspectives. Well, actually, vast differences in your perspectives. But let's, let's take a step back for a moment. Let's try something here. Let's try and make sure that as we continue in this conversation, we do so in good faith and try to come to an understanding, right? So what I would love is if we can come to both of you and in a sentence or two, if you can just summarize in a constructive way what the other person's argument is, right? So Raghav, if I might come to you, can you please summarize Matthew's argument as accurately as you can in one or two sentences, please? Of course, Nelifa. So I agree with Matthew when he says that the online, uh, you know, your online life is an extension of your offline presence. Um, Matthew also said that the Internet is an extension of our lives in the sense that whatever we are offline, we're often online as well. And Matthew suggested that we need a similar system of governance um, as we have in the offline world for that to be extended in the online online world as well. And then Matthew said that, uh, you know, he, with his experience in big tech, he does not believe that self-regulation or co-regulation by big tech is a sustainable form of regulating uh, on social media. Matthew, is that accurate? Very accurate. Thank you. Right. <laughs> um, and, and I think the, the 
the point you made um, is very clear and strong yes. is that there's too much power, too much power in the hands of very few companies. Um, and very yeah. few. Uh, uh, Matthew, I'd love for you to go on and if you could just do exactly what you're doing. So tell me what you think Raghav's argument is and, and, and as succinctly as you can, please. Uh, sure thing. So yeah, R Raghav was very clear on the power of uh, very few companies, and these companies are actually based in the US. So it set a tone for uh, you know online lives, and, and this was very uh, very interesting to hear. And uh, the power they have is is probably too much, mm -hmm. and they're actually more powerful than countries. So how do you balance that? And uh, what Raghav was saying is maybe we need their help as well to regulate because they are very powerful and very knowledgeable of what's going on online. Raghav, is that accurate? That is very accurate. Okay, so we have done our best here at the start of this important conversation to acknowledge each other's positions, differences, and so we can move forward. If you are just joining us, welcome. This is Doha Debates on Twitter Spaces. We're having a debate about social media with Raghav, a lawyer specializing in social media and regulation, and Matthew, an expert in helping to fight online hate. If you have any questions, thoughts, comments, please tweet us at Doha Debates or just press the little comment button and tell me what you make of what you've heard so far. Back to jumping right into the deep end, uh, my dear guests. I want to focus on the essence of the conversation for the next little while. How can we make the online world, this space we keep talking about, reflect the needs, our, our need for safety that we have in the physical world? Well, we put a poll to our followers online and we ask, what is something that would make you feel safer online? Okay, so the majority of people said platform accountability, that thing that both of you have mentioned, 55.9%. Government oversight polled at nearly 15%. They said that would be important. Increased moderation was nearly at 18%. And about 12% of people said fewer rules and regulations, which is not nothing and something I really want to come back to. If we take on the governments then, right, 14.7% said that government oversight would make them feel safer online, Rogov. Do we need more government regulation what do we have? Is it effective? I mean, you work across three important uh, uh, markets, territories, countries. Is anyone getting it right? So that's an interesting question. And it's great to have this data based on your poll as well. I do believe that just like governments regulate in the offline space, um, to some extent, there is need for some governmental oversight of speech as well as platforms in the online world as well. There was an American uh, Supreme Court justice uh, who famously said that my free speech ends when I shout fire in a crowded theater, meaning that I have my free speech, but if I go out to a public space and suddenly create panic, that is where my free speech ends. Um, there is, however, a problem and a challenge when it comes to governments having too much power. Let me paint this picture with a few examples. Um, so let's go back to the Arab Spring Revolution from 2011 and 2012 um, and the build up towards it. Or let's go back to the protests in Hong Kong from a couple of years ago. Now, imagine that I am a dissident. I'm a political dissident in one of these countries. And if the government has a vast amount of power over social media platforms, the government forces these platforms to take down any kind of dissent on that platform. Um, so we need to understand that while governments might do, you know, they do have certain powers and at many times they often have a good faith interest in regulating the online public space. There is also a natural, you know, um, discrepancy in often the government's interests and a citizen's interest. Another thing that, you know, we need to think about is often governments don't have an exact idea of where the society's morality lies. Let me give you an example. I come from India and uh, India over the last many decades has evolved and 
you know, India is a massive country with over 1.4 billion people. And our sense of what is considered obscene and what is not considered obscene is very different if you go to Bangalore, uh, which is India's tech center. And if you go to rural, a rural part of the country in, you know, um, you know, in maybe the, the heartland or another place, right? So if I put up an image of a breast cancer survivor um, and that has a female nipple, um, one person in one part of the country might think it is obscene, while I, whereas another person in a different part of the country think that, hey, this is spreading awareness. The problem with the government being entrusted with the power and the duty of sort of determining what should or should not be spoken online means that you have the government's definition of right and wrong, the government's definition of morality, and the government's definition of who should speak and what uh, they should speak about and the extent of criticism that uh, is allowed against their policies. So while I do believe there is room for governmental um, interference and, and some role of the government. I'm not a, a, a huge proponent of governments having excessive power because history has shown us that when you have governments given a certain amount of power, uh, it's a slippery slope and often you have the rise of authoritarian tendencies uh, within that power uh, that governments can often exercise. Right. And in fact, platform accountability counted for over half of that vote. Matthew, I don't want to get in the way of a good conversation here. So if you ever want to speak on what Raghav has said, please feel free to do so as we continue this conversation. Anything you want to build on on that on, on those figures? Yeah, I think Raghav is making really good points um, and that governments you know, should be telling us what we should see and shouldn't see. That, that's clear. Uh, and that's the big risk of them regulating and moderating content on online. Um, so that, that's why I think the solution that I've been working on for a long, long time is giving people the choice. You know, if you live in Bangalore, you have the choice to see that or don't see it. And this is how we should be regulating platforms is to give every single user the choice of seeing, watching, reading what they want. And that's actually the opposite um, part of the product uh, Big Tech is building. Everything is pushed to us and everything is pushed to us through algorithms we don't control. Everything is pushed to us through uh, ideas we, we don't uh, control as well. And the point is, how do we build social media and social platforms that are for us as individual, but not, not the opposite? Um, so to, to sum up this point is, I completely agree um, with Raghav, and we should regulate platforms for them to be more transparent about how and what we really, and to respect our choices. You know, if I tell the platform, I don't want to be seeing that, I don't want to be reading that, I don't want to be watching this video, I should be able to do so, which is not the case. I'm treated like another uh, person, uh, and I'm just a number, I'm a piece of code within billions of people. Uh, and this is not um, the way society should be built. Would you say we're getting it wrong more than we're getting it right? As quick as in a, in a quick answer, if you can, Matthew. Uh, yeah, very quickly. I, I think we, we it just it's not right or wrong. It's just the model, you know, like big tech, Google, Apple, all of these guys. They've got one goal, and that's simple: making money. So they built product to make money, not to make sure we understand how the society and how, you know, it's, it's not, it's not about that. So they have designed product mm. uh, to make a lot of money and not to educate us. You know, if we think we're going to be educated by Google, it's completely wrong okay. um, because they fight. Right, well, you get the point. That was a very well made point, but I want to get a question in from uh, one of our listeners uh, and an audience member at this point. Fatima Nazar is part of our Doha Debates Ambassador Program. It is a first of its kind initiative for young change makers from all across the world um, to get together and get involved um, uh, uh, with, with the program. We would love to hear your question next, Fatima. Hi, good evening, everyone. I hope all is well. Uh, thank you, Nalafar. So my question is, in my home country, Pakistan, social media is considered a main source of information. 
Regardless of the authenticity of this information, it is trusted more than the local news, channels, and influencers take advantage of this fact and use social media to spread disinformation, increase polarization, and to promote cancel culture. How can we stop the deliberate misuse of social media by the users themselves? Who wants to jump in first? I feel, Raghav, maybe I want to come to you just because you've mentioned India. And I want to contextualize what's happening in Pakistan, Iran, uh, other nations around the world. This idea that if we don't create rules made by the government, well, the government will create rules on us forcibly. What do you make of this? Thanks, Fatima, for that question. And thanks, Nelufar, for providing additional context. And, you know, I must admit that I come from India and large parts of my family are in India. And, you know, the problem of social media being used to spread disinformation and misinformation and malinformation um, is a problem that I have personally, first-hand experience. Um, you know, I think we're on the same page there. Um, that said, um, I do believe that uh, when we're talking about what constitutes, you know, how we should think about misinformation and disinformation and the appropriate ways of dealing with that, we need to be aware of the reality that there's going to be huge differences in variances, uh, uh, and, and variances in what constitutes misinformation in the first place. Um, me making a certain allegation against a government um, and, let's say, corruption in, in a government might be, you know, a, a member of a ruling party might think this is me spreading disinformation and and and. and I might have a very different approach. That said, I'm sure there are many things which are more black and white. Uh, for example, if I go out, uh, you know, not, uh, I'm, I'm sure this is going to be a, a mystery to everybody, but as a head of a state, if I say that you need to be injecting bleach in your bloodstream to cure COVID, um, that might, you know, that's that's maybe not in the gray area. That's, that's a more black and white issue. Yeah. Um, the solution to that, in my opinion, is a mix of media literacy, uh, which is making people and users aware of reliability of sources, what, you know, uh, identifying misinformation or disinformation or identifying what is a credible news organization and how to fact check on their own basis, as well as some measures within the business models of tech companies where, for example, they don't necessarily amplify or promote information that is going viral and that is necessarily uh, not true. And another thing is, the development of toolkits, which are consisting of lesser restrictive measures. So I do believe there is a there's a huge challenge, uh, Nelufar, where social media platforms start removing hordes of content if they believe this is disinformation. And I do believe that when social media platforms have that power to do that, you're essentially shrinking the civic space to an extent that becomes uh, narrow and narrow over time. So I do believe that a combination of media literacy and lesser restrictive measures and users sort of understanding how to differentiate between misinformation and, 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 and fact might be the uh, might be the way to go. Go for it, Matthew, please. Yeah, I, I could not I could not agree more. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like the first point is exactly on, you know, the social platform business model. Uh, more content, more engagement, more scandals, more money. It's as simple as that. Uh, when you look at, you know, conspiracy theories, you know, they're fun, they're cool to spread. Um, and so it's, a, again, a misuse of the platform. You know, they should not be making money due to the fact that you get more likes or shares. You know, it's wrong in the first place. So we build products that push us to spread misinformation, um, which is not good in the first place. Then when you look at the way the product is built again, is all about recommended videos, recommended content, recommended everything. So media literacy is super important. It's very critical for society. We are lazy as people. We just, you know, <laughs> dial in, open our feed and read whatever we get. You know, it's, it's, it's bad. So from the very beginning at school, media literacy is super important. Uh, we just need to check the source, check the information, read different things. And again, social platforms should be pushed to push us different ideas and to debate, you know, like you shouldn't be in a bubble. Uh, and this is where the, the, the platform should improve a lot. And, and the last point, just to finish on that is, we should be creating 
uh, new platforms when it comes to media. You know, traditional media is not trusted, that's for sure. But does it mean social media should be the place to find trusted information? I don't think so. Fatima, I want to bring you back here. What do you make of that? Those were quite important. You got some solutions there, but also an explanation of why these things can be super tricky to do when profits are the motive. What do you make of everything you've heard so far? Thank you so much for the wonderful answers. I think that um, all of the answers point towards having more regulatory bodies and finding ways to uh, make sure that the civilian space is not jeopardized. Um, however, I do believe that it is quite a difficult model to implement in places where we have restrictive resources or lack of incentives to do so. Uh, for example, in Pakistan, you would rarely find people who would, um, you know, try to go to the core of the of the story because the story changes every minute. So rather than finding the true source, they they, they try to you know, spread it as fast as, as they can for the sake of incentives, profits and stuff. And then they just move on with that information being spread out into the world and not even trying to regulate it. Yeah. So I think we need a resource uh, specific uh, model that can be implemented in low and middle income countries as well, just to make sure that the model that we are trying to build is sustainable and yeah. applicable as well. Oh my gosh, so you, you, I think you've absolutely hit on the head. Thank you so much for that contribution, Fatima. Very, very uh, important. Um, let's take a little step back here. Um, uh, Raghav, uh, Matthew, is there anything in the conversation we've had at the moment that you might want to ask each other, some clarity or a point that was really well made about social media and safety? Anything that you want to say to each other? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be curious to to hear your point of view on co-regulation. So would it mean that you would invite to the table uh, the likes of Google, Meta, government bodies, and, uh, and start a discussion? Is that what you, you have in mind? Thanks, Matthew. That's a fair question. I'll quickly just answer that. And then I'll, uh, uh, you know, I, I also had something that I'd love to know a little more about. So what I meant by core regulation was the state defining some broad boundaries. For example, the state saying that child sexual abuse material or violent extremism is something that is not allowed and that should be taken down, you know, um, at an appropriate uh, timeline. Uh, and as well as platforms um, increasing their transparency measures, so explaining what content they're promoting, what content they're downranking, and also users and platforms being, uh, you know, users being given the choice of uh, deciding what content they want to see and what content they don't. So that is what I meant by co-regulation. Um, a question that I had, so and a question that I had, and you know, I'd, I'd love a little, uh, a little more insight, and uh, uh, you know, I'd love to know what you think about this. Uh, so from what I gather, you are, uh, you know, for you, the role that big tech is playing is a little more black and white than it is for me. Um, I, I gather that you are, you know. Um, you don't uh, see many good things coming out of uh, how big you know big tech platforms operate and their incentives. My question to you is: If we do paint big tech in that uh, you know with that sort of paintbrush, do you think we're opening up the door to also governments getting more powerful and government sort of cracking down on social media platforms? And aren't we essentially then narrowing civic space for average users and citizens? Uh, what do you feel about this? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. To, to, to share some feedback, so I've worked um, a few years in the public policy team at Google. Um, I was um, actually working on online safety um, on behalf of Google. And my objectives were very much to shake hands with policymakers to make sure they see Google in a good way. And so when we were making moves, it was only to... Uh, make friendships and making sure that we can uh, deregulate everything that it, it's in progress. Uh, and my, my boss was reporting to, uh, to the business side. It was not to the philanthropic side or it was not to the social side. It was all business. Um, so what I mean by that is big tech or you know, business driven. And uh, if you read the letter that was sent to Zuckerberger yesterday, I think it was yesterday, uh, it's all about 
you know, capex and profits, and uh, it's not about making the world a better place. So that's why I see it a bit black and white. Is I've seen it firsthand, and uh, I don't expect them to save me or save children. This is not the job. Um, so you know, it's just a bit of context on that. And then um, you know, regarding your your, your question on on that, um, it is. Uh, it, it is just too big um, in a sense of, uh, I think we spend pretty much 80% of our time on, you know, three apps, maybe four apps. And if we include gaming, that's pretty much everything we do online. Um, so we, we need to probably look at different sources of information, different apps to, to engage with uh, different type of media as well. So I, I want to see, I want to see that. And if you've got more sources, more platforms to go to, go to there is no risk at all for free speech. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm interested in, at this point, after we've, we've heard that back and forth, to bring in another audience question, which seems really important for where we are right now. So Inna Castro is also part of the Doha Debates Ambassador Programme. In a, what is your question to our guests? Hello, everyone. Um, regarding what uh, the speakers have mentioned about media literacy, I stand with them. And also, I believe that education plays a role in media literacy. It is significant that individuals should be knowledgeable on how to effectively access and use different media. So my question would be focusing on what are the ways that we could improve media literacy within the curriculums of education? Who wants to take this, Matthew? I feel like you've uh, been quick at un unmuting yourself. <laughs> unmuted, yeah. Board. Um, Go on. A, a, a lot of my family members are teachers. And, you know, when we meet for Christmas, the, the one thing that I note is that uh, they don't really you know, understand what's going on. You know, um, do teachers have TikTok? Um, do they, you know, like spend hours and hours on Instagram? So I, I think there's a, a sense of training for teachers and they should be understanding, you know, this new era a lot more. It's not that they don't want to do it, it's that they don't see value or they don't, you know, they don't have any help doing this. But that's important. It's important to understand how kids engage with one another and, and what they, what, you know, what, how they interact on, on, online. So that's the one thing is we need to have national, international wide trainings on social platforms. I think that's the first step. The, the second one, uh, all parents. Same story, you know, like if you have got kids and I don't like it, but uh, I just go on TikTok to check what's going on and I type and I search for keywords that I don't want my kids to search for. And I want to see what, what type of content appears. Uh, you know, I'm looking for, you know, um, um, stuff that you, you don't want to watch. And most often I, I see content that is not suitable for under 15 nor under 13. So it is also um, important for us to engage with these platforms and, and to be part of uh, what's coming. So if I could jump in, um, Nelifa? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so I fully agree with Matthew when he says that there is a role that teachers as well as parents play. Um, and in my opinion, you know, if I could add to that, I think media literacy is not a destination. Uh, but it's a journey. Of course, uh, younger people who are in school or, you know, who are still sort of getting acclimatized uh, to surviving online need media, media literacy, as well as older people who might not be digital natives. But so do people like you and I, uh, who are, you know, who, who work on the internet, who and who, you know, who seek entertainment on the internet, but the nature of media changes at such a fast pace today that I am not sure that if I see a deep fake video, 
I will necessarily be able to tell the difference between a real video and a deep fake video. And that is as much a commentary on my, you know, um, my me not being perfect as it is a commentary on how advanced uh, these technologies are becoming. Um, so in terms of how we need to think about media literacy, I think we need to think about media literacy across demographics. In, in, in one way, so for younger people, older people, middle-aged people, as well as across issues. So for example, there is a need for media literacy around elections, where you talk about this is a message coming from a platform, but uh, you know this is a message coming from a particular candidate. But just because a WhatsApp message says that this is by a member of the opposition party, you don't necessarily believe it. Um, so you need election media literacy, but you also need media literacy around the, medi uh, the medical community, for example, where, you know, if I just because I read a home remedy on WhatsApp um, or on Reddit, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. So I think there's, you know, there's a we need to think about this in a in a in a digital hygiene way. So, you know, Matthew correctly mentioned that, uh, you know, if a parent looks at, um, uh, you know, uh, tries to get an understanding of what their child is consuming on TikTok. Um, I, I, you know, I think that's very important. And there's also a need for, I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to advocate for helicopter parenting. So let me just uh, sort of put that disclaimer. But what I am trying to say is that there is a, 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 a space for there to be more dialogue between parents and children, between social media companies and their users, uh, between uh, election officials and voters. And it's a, it's a journey, not a destination. While other people have been chiming in and getting their perspectives over to us, it's tweet time. So I'm just going to tell you a bit, um, Matthew and Raghav, of the conversation that's been happening around you. So we've had one person tweet in um, saying that regular criminal justice should extend to social media. Problem solved. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, Sid Humer at Sid uh, Humer says self accountability and integrity is what is needed only. And in in addition to that uh, to that poll that we ran, we asked should governments be accountable for disinformation on the internet? And this one was pretty clear cut. Yes, fifty two point four percent of the people that responded agreed, um, and. No, only 31% said that uh, it should be the platforms. Uh, there are some more tweets in that I'd love to get to. Uh, at Shasho M says, the government can perhaps ensure the policies are holding up, but the ones spreading the information need to be held accountable or nothing will change. I've got one final one. Uh, at Muna underscore A underscore Jammer says, a very contentious issue due to worries about infringement of freedom of expression. But something needs to be done when thousands of people follow a post which claims you can treat cancer with eating garlic three times a day. I've already been misinformed because it's either bleach or cancer, uh, bleach or, or garlic. I'm not sure which one's curing cancer or treating COVID here. But these are the kind of things that we're talking about, isn't it? Making sure that we have some level of accountability, some level of uh, freedom, but also a, a level of regulation that's coming through clearly on folks that are, are talking to us on Twitter. Thanks. Thank you very much. And if you're joining us, well, we are nearly at the end of this discussion. And if you've missed any of it, do not worry. The full recording will be made available to you on Twitter as soon as this stream has ended. And we would encourage you to listen to the debate from the top. Um, but now it's time to sort of get towards the end of this this discussion that we've been having. Um, we've, we've had very different viewpoints, enthusiastically, respectfully debating about the different tactics. It seems that there are some clear strata, some clear roads we want to go down. We want to respect the public. We want to empower the public. We want to regulate the space, but we do not want to create bottlenecks of power that the powerful, the invisible, or the unanswerable um, uh, may, may possess. So at this stage, I'd like to go to our speakers. Is there anything then, if I might come to you first, Raghav, that you have heard today that has made you pause, think differently, or maybe even made you change your mind? Thanks, Nelifar, and... I fully agree when you say that we're all in agreement that there should be no bottlenecks of power. 
Mm. I have been thinking about a comment that you made uh, where you know you said that a social media user uh, you know um, another user said that you just need to extend criminal laws to the online space um and i've been thinking about that and smiling to myself because i think that is asking for trouble um you know the un special rapporteur on freedom of speech and expression has said that introducing any kind of criminal sanction on speech is problematic and inherently disproportional um so you know it makes me uh, stop and think about sure you might have the expert saying that any kind of criminalization is a problem but often uh, you know the general sentiment is that hey if somebody is spreading misinformation send them to jail and hold them responsible and everything's going to be just fine so that makes me think about the need for there to be greater engagement between mm-hmm. you know an expert sitting in their ivory tower and and somebody who's just coming from a bona fide place and thinking about uh, different solutions <laughs> I really love that. Fantastic. I'm glad that our listeners made you think. Matthew, if I might come to you, anything you've heard that's made you pause or even think differently? Yeah, I think the the point of you know working together and collaboratively is very important. And the point that Raghav made on that I think is critical. Uh, yeah. Critical because we we are actually we're going through a new transition, you know, we're going into web 3.0. This is happening, um, and that's a very important moment in time to sit down and to put together maybe frameworks, different laws, because that's the next step. Like everything today is two point zero, it is pretty much flat. Uh, this is going to be pretty, and this is going to be we're going to get to a new stage uh, in the next you know five to ten years. So um, I think it's time to sit down, relax, and uh, have a good chat. I love that. I'm I'm glad to hear that uh, I might be able to have this conversation with you in our new reality of the web 3.0. Raghav Mandirathar, Matthew Butar, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure. Thank Thanks so much. A true pleasure. Uh, a, a big thank you also to the audience. I'm sure my guests will join in in saying that. Doha Debates will be back on Twitter Spaces in a couple of weeks. We're going to have a conversation about climate change. While you wait, though, why don't you go to Doha Debates um, on our website and check out some of the amazing content we've got there. Two amazing podcasts for you to look at, The Negotiators and The Long Game. You can also head to our YouTube channel and watch our full debates sign up to our wonderful newsletter at dohadebates.com that is all from me your host Nella Fahdayat I'll see you next time bye